Good morning, church. Look at someone and say, good morning. Good morning. Let's wave to Facebook, type good morning in the chat, and look at someone and say, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Uh, so happy to have you here. And uh, let's all just stand together before we open, just in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, God. We are so thankful that we get to be in your house, God. We are thankful. This is a privilege that we get to do this. And God, I pray this morning, as we're all gathered together in your name, Lord, we pray that you would just speak to us, that you would just be in our midst, Lord. We know in your word it says where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in their midst. So we thank you that that, that is a promise and that you are here. And God, I pray that as we're gathered here, Lord, that your spirit would draw more people. God, people may be walking on the street today who don't know you, Lord. I pray that they would feel your presence, and Lord, that they would feel drawn in here, God. I pray that you would speak to us, Lord, and that we would leave here changed. We set this time aside for you, and we thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 i 
a couple minutes and be seated. We just have a few announcements as Pastor Jeremy has always already said, happy Mother's Day to all the moms. As you are leaving, ladies, as all of the ladies are leaving this morning, there will be a gift for you. So please see Bobby Joe at the end of service and she will have those for you. We just want to say to all the ladies, those that are moms and those of us that are not, Happy Mother's Day, and we appreciate and love the ladies, the women of our church. Amen. Just a couple brief announcements for all of the announcements. Please see your bulletin. But um, a couple things this coming Saturday is Hearts and Hands for Him Breakfast. Ladies, you are asked to please bring a teacup with you when you come. So if you have any questions this morning, see Darlene. And also, we are going to be having our first fellowship of the summer. We are super excited. That's right, Aaron. Go ahead and clap. <laughs> Friday, June 2nd at Oak Hollow Park, we have reserved the Pine Pavilion. We are going to start at 6 p.m. The church will be providing the drinks, the hamburgers, and the hot dogs. There will be more details next week about uh, the rest of the food for that evening. But please, please mark it on your calendar. That's just a few weeks away, Friday, June 2nd at Oak Hollow Park. If you need directions, we will have them in the bulletin starting next week. And if you have any questions, please call the church office. So also we, um, we're going to be receiving um, a new member, Sue Brown, this morning. She recently went through our membership class. Um, Pastor Cindy is not here. Next Sunday, we will be receiving Sue as a member. You'll see it's in the bulletin, but we are going to revisit that. Pastor's a little under the weather today, so you can be praying for her. Um, just not been feeling well this week, so just continue to pray for her. And with that in mind, we're going to pray for all of the needs in the bulletin as well. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are a God that hears us, a God that sees us. We thank you today, Lord, that you see every need that's written on this bulletin, all of the names on this list. And Lord, once again, we just pray for them. We pray for our pastor today. We ask that, Lord, you would strengthen her and restore her to 100% health. And we ask, Lord, for each one on this bulletin that you would meet and minister every need. Those in need of your touch, those in need of your strength and peace and encouragement, we ask that you would meet each one right where they are. And we thank you, Lord, for the testimonies that are going to come as we believe you for answered prayer. We love you and we thank you and we commit this all now into your capable hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Our ushers are coming this morning to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Jimmy, will you pray for the offering this morning? As the ushers pass you by, you can stand as we continue to worship this morning.
We thank you for that reality today that you will never, ever fail. Lord, you are a sure, you are a firm foundation on which to build our lives. We thank you, Lord. We put our trust in you. We put our confidence in you, Jesus. There is no one like you. Thank you, Lord.
Just give him thanks. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. You are faithful. You are so good. There is no one like you. All of my days, Lord, you have been faithful. You are good always. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You are a constant. You are unchanging, Lord. stop we will sing of the goodness of the Lord for eternity amen we will declare and sing his praises you can go ahead this morning and be seated pastor Bill is coming this morning to bring the word to us Thank you, worship team. Very good. Praise the Lord. I get teased somewhat because I wear suspenders, but I assure you it's biblical. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse 9, it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So, so God is good. This morning I want to talk to you about the power of the tongue. We don't realize the power of the tongue and the words that we speak. We can lift up, encourage, edify, exhort in one moment, and tear down, destroy, and crush the next with the same tongue. Proverbs 18.21 tells us, death and life are in the power of the tongue. For as little as the tongue is, it's surprising how few people can hold it. Even a fish doesn't get in trouble if he keeps his mouth shut. <laughs> James 3.8 tells us, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. 
But James 3, 2 tells us that if any man is able to bridle his tongue, he is a perfect man. It is better to have people think you're a fool than open your mouth and prove it. You know, just try to hold onto the tongue. Our text today is Mark 11, 20 to 26. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which I curse us is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. The events of this week in our context was the Passion Week. Jesus had entered victoriously into Jerusalem where he was held as Messiah, the son of David, and they were shouting Hosanna. And Jesus came to the fig tree which should have had fruit. The fig tree is symbolic of Israel. And it did not, and so he cursed it. He was, he was cursing the religious practices of Israel. Everything for Israel was routine, by rote, only with head knowledge and no heart knowledge. Everything was a ritual, and they were missing the time of their visitation. They knew all about God, but didn't know God. As 1 Corinthians 2.8 states, For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. For when uh, they knew when to celebrate the feast, but didn't realize who the feast pointed to. They were careful to observe the sacrifices and offer up the Passover lamb, but didn't realize who the Passover lamb was. They were careful to keep the letter of the law, but knew nothing about the spirit of the law. And Jesus cursed it and spoke uh, to the tree and said unto it. And I want to stop there for a moment. When was the last time you talked to a tree? I know there are tree huggers out there, but when was the last time you talked to a tree? Verse 14 reads, And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And the next morning, Peter points out that it dried from the roots up. It didn't die in a normal way from the top down, but supernaturally from the roots up. And the tree had withered away. Then Jesus says unto them, Have faith in God. What the Greek technically is saying here, Have the faith of God. Have God faith. What kind of faith is God faith? On the first day of creation, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God didn't jump back and say, whoa, I never thought that was going to happen. You know, he knew it was going to happen. He spoke it and it became. Having a faith is not doubting whatsoever. In the faith chapter, Hebrews 11 and verse 1, it says, now faith. The faith you have right now, not the faith of uh, tomorrow or the faith sometime in the future, but now faith is believing you have the substance of things hoped for without any evidence of them being seen. Hebrews 11:6. but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. When God speaks to your heart and gives you a promise and you hear from God, you must believe him that he is going to fulfill that thing that he has spoken to you. That not only is he able to give you the desires of your heart, because most would consent, yeah, I know God's able, but you believe he is going to do it. He is going to do what he has promised. Then Jesus goes on in verse 23 to say, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now we move from talking to trees to talking to mountains here. And by the way, it doesn't take any more faith to remove a mountain than it does a tree. A uh, mustard seed of faith can handle each of these equally well. But I want you to pay close attention to what is going on here. Jesus is giving us a kingdom principle, and it has to do with what comes out of your mouth. 
For verily I say unto you. Now Jesus is uh, imparting something here that is important that he wants us to understand. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Are we actually supposed to speak unto the mountain? Jesus says we are. He spoke to the tree and it obeyed him. And he's telling us if we say to the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, it's going to obey you. Jesus spoke to sicknesses. He spoke to leprosy. He spoke to diseases. And these seemingly inanimate objects obeyed him. In Mark 5, 8, 9, Jesus spoke to a legion of demons that was in the demoniac of Gadarenes. And they obeyed him. In Mark 4, 39, Jesus is in the hinder part of the ship fast asleep. And his disciples feared that they were going to drown. And it reads, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Jesus stood up and rebuked first the wind, and then he said unto the sea, Be thou still. Then he said to his disciples, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Would you classify someone who goes around talking to trees and wind and sea as someone who's a few fries short of a Happy Meal? That their elevator doesn't quite reach the top floor? You know, just Smith Wigglesworth in his healing ministry, he spoke to cancer, alcoholism, sickness, disease, and saw a plethora of supernatural healings. Smith Wigglesworth in his ministry is noted to have raised 31 people from the dead. On one occasion, he was asked to come and pray for their mother who had just passed away. He came into the room and he lifted her out of her, out of her bed and set her in the corner. And he held her with one hand, and with the other, he pointed into her face after slapping her a few times. And he says, Death, I rebuke you, come out of her. And she began to breathe. We can speak into inanimate objects. In fact, God is telling us to do. We've taken it from trees to mountains to death. Now let's take it up a notch. Let's try some other objects, something that's about a sixth the size of the earth or something that's 200 million times the size of the earth. In Joshua 10, 12 to 14, then spake Joshua to the Lord in a day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites of the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, he spoke it out plainly for all of Israel to hear what Joshua was saying. Sun stand still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Joshua spake and said in the sight of Israel, God hearkened unto the voice of a man. This is not name it and claim it and blab it and grab it theology as we'll look at a couple of other elements that come in to play in this. But just to illustrate the biblical principle of speaking out in faith to things. Objects and things that, hey, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. You know, just uh, we've entered into a supernatural world where things are different and they're on a different plane than in the natural world that we're used to living in. When Moses died, Joshua was chosen by God to be Israel's next leading leader. And he told Joshua that he would be with him as he was with Moses. He told him in Joshua 1, 5 that he would not fail him nor forsake him. Joshua 1, 6, be strong and of good courage. Joshua 1, 7, stay in the word and don't deviate it from the right or to the left. Now listen to what God says to Joshua in 1, 8. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now who wouldn't want to be prosperous and have good success? Three simple things to do. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. You are to speak the word of God. And thou shalt meditate on it day and night. You are to believe the word of God. And thou mayest uh, observe to do according to all that is written in. Then you're to do the word of God. Speak it, believe it, and do it. 
Now let's go back to our text in verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you will receive them and ye shall have them. This is the second aspect of the passage and it deals with believing. But there is somewhat something subtle in this and that deals with prayer. What things soever ye desire in prayer. Prayer implies a certain amount of intimacy. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. What is the promise? That he shall give you the desires of your heart. What is the condition? That you delight yourself in the Lord. If you delight yourself in the Lord, then God will give you the desires of your heart. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, we'll find that our desires begin to change that they're not so self-centered now but reaching out more they reach out to other ministries uh, as we minister to our fellow man they reach out to ministry to God as we serve him and the closer we get to the Lord our desires begin to change for a deeper intimacy with God and now we no longer want that 65 inch tv set but more time with God we no longer would be delighted in more uh, jewelry or furs or cars or trucks, but more intimacy with God. When we delight ourselves with God, we become God-focused and spirit-oriented. And what was once the desire of our heart are no more the desires of our heart. And uh, they move from the carnal to the spiritual and from the natural to the supernatural. Psalm 46.10 reads, Be still and know that I am God. The word know is the Hebrew word yada, which means to know in a deep, personal, intimate, and reverent way. That is how God knows us, and that is how he wants us to know him. And he gives us a formula for drawing closer to him in a more intimate way by being still before him, drawing close to him. It's the same word that describes Adam and Eve's relationship in Genesis 4.1, when it says, in Adam knew his wife and she conceived God wants to birth something in us something different than what we've had before he wants to birth a deeper relationship than we have had before regardless of where you are in your walk with the Lord you can always go deeper and God wants us uh, to go deeper with him being still so we can know someone better is almost a lost art and especially with all the things that are happening around about us, with the busyness of the day and life schedules. And we live in the fallacy that next week when things aren't so busy and it never happens. In 1 Kings 19, we see Elijah coming to the mountain that God showed him. And there is a great strong wind that is blowing rocks off this mountain, but God was not in the wind. And there was an earthquake that was shaking the whole mountain, but God was not in the earthquake. Then there was a great fire, and God was not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice, and God began to speak, and Elijah was hearing what God was saying. Sometimes there is a lot of lightning and a lot of thunder, but there's no rain. You know, wait for the still, small voice. Learn how to calm yourself and be still in a busy, chaotic world so that you can hear what God is saying. Prayer implies intimacy and closeness with God so that we can hear the voice of God when he begins to speak to us. Years ago, Rex Humbart was on the Merv Griffin show, and Merv Griffin somewhat sarcastically said, Oh, so you're the man that God speaks to. And, Merv's, and Rex Humbard says, God speaks to every man. What's he saying to you? There was quiet, then a commercial. <laughs> Romans 10, 17 tells us, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When we spend time alone with God and become more intimate with God, and we become still, God begins to speak to us, and we know that we know that we know that we will have what we ask of him. And here's where faith comes in, that we have the assurance and we believe and God gives us the desires of our heart. You know, just first the intimacy, 
then the product. First, the closeness with God. Then we have what we need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. Verse 25 and 26, And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Unforgiveness will not only hinder your prayers, it can make them null and void completely. To hold on to bitterness will destroy your relationship with God and certainly destroy your intimacy with God. In 1 Peter 2.18, it tells us, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. The froward, the word froward means mean and nasty. Employees, be in subjection to your bosses, not only to the good ones, but also to the mean and nasty ones. You know, it's not the ups and downs that bother me. It's all the jerks. You know, even if your boss is a jerk, you know, God put them over you for a reason and a purpose. And we're to submit to all authority, God tells us in Romans 13. Now, in 1 Peter 3, 1, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Likewise refers back to 1 Peter 2, 17. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to not only your good and gentle husbands, but also to the mean and nasty ones. Let's go a little further, 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. Not only to the good and uh, gentle wise, but also the mean and nasty ones. And it goes on to say that your prayer is not being hindered. If trees and mountains are going to be removed in your marriage, and if you're going to be prosperous and have good success, the husband and the wife have to be on the same page. She must be submissive and he must rule in love, honoring his wife. In the marriage chapter, Ephesians 5, husbands are told to love their wives three times, and never once is the wife told to love her husband. The reason is because husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church. 1 John 4.19 declares, we love him because he first loved us. We as the bride of Christ respond to God's love and in the same manner a white wife could resist the love of a husband who is willing to lay his life down for her, to love her like Christ loved the church. Women need love, men need respect. What happens in a relationship that is going sire is when when the woman says, I'm not going to show him any respect until he starts showing me love. And he says, I'm not going to show her love until she starts showing me some respect. And they're in a Mexican standoff here, and neither one's going to budge, and neither one's going to move. I'd like to read the verse that closes out this chapter, Ephesians 5.33, from the Amplified Bible. It reads, however, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife as being, in a sense, his very own self. And let the wife see that she respect and reverences her husband, that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. That's the amplified version, men. (laughs) Here's what that looks like when it's played out. When a husband pulls into the driveway after a hard day's wear, wear, day at work, the wife hears the car, and with reverence she says to the kids, the husband is home. And they run out with flower, rose petals and uh, throw them in the way as he makes his way into the house. And as he comes in, she's waiting with grapes to hand feed him while the kids have got big fans flowing over him. Corey Ten Boom and her, and her family hid Jews and helped smuggle them out of Holland during World War II. Someone turned him in, and she and her sister and her father were arrested. Ten days later, her father died in a concentration camp, and later on in time, her sister also died in a concentration camp. Corey got released by a clerical mistake. 
uh, after the war, she was preaching in her hometown, and then after the service, a man came up and said, Miss Tin Boom, I've become a Christian like you. Can you forgive me? Corey recognized the man immediately as the one who betrayed her and her family to the Nazis that resulted in the death of her father and her sister. She looked to heaven and said, God, I can't forgive him. And God said, I know, Corey, but I can. Let me do it through you. We were never intended to love each other in our own strength. We were never intended to forgive one another in our own strength. We were never intended to submit one to another in our own strength. We are simply to be yielded vessels unto God that he can flow through. That's all that we're to be is just be yielded to God and God will do the rest. Now I want to have some prayer with you and I want to do this in reverse. We have to take care of the obstacles that would hinder our prayers being answered. In Hebrews 12, 15, it talks about falling from grace because of the root of bitterness that troubles us. We have to get this out by the root. We have to get rid of unforgiveness and bitterness. In the Lord's Prayer, the only part of the prayer that Jesus commented on was the part of forgiving others. Jesus went on to say, if you don't forgive others, your Father won't forgive you, your trespasses. Now, this is as serious as a heart attack. You know, just, and he says the same thing here in our passage. If you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. You can't walk through this world without being offended, hurt, ridiculed, persecuted, hated, or put down in some way. It's going to happen. Ladies, time to put your big girl pants on. Men, time to face things. You're not going to be loved by everybody in this world. You know, God has forgiven us all big time. (laughs) Big time. You know, just uh, let it go. It's not a matter of even... It's going to not matter one day in eternity what you're holding on to. This bitterness is destroying you and your relationship with God and intimacy with God more than you could possibly know. Uh, When you set others free, you set yourself free. I want us all to bow our hearts, and we're going to just pray for forgiveness. Maybe there's somebody in your, your life, maybe uh, someone comes to mind and just uh, you haven't been able to get along with them and just uh, they've hurt you, they've wounded you. I, I know the pain might still be there. It might have been in your childhood, might be recent, but God wants you to let that bitterness go and he wants to forgive through you. Father, right now, Lord God, we want to remove this obstacle out of our life an obstacle that hinders our relationship with you, an obstacle that hinders our intimacy with you. Lord, the bitterness has, has hurt us and damaged our spirit more uh, than we can possibly know. And right now, Lord, I ask for the help of the Holy Spirit as we would yield ourselves to him, that he would begin to flow and begin to, uh, to heal and to forgive. Lord, that he would supernaturally empower us to let go of our hurts this day, that from this day forward, we will not have those anymore. We will not experience those pains uh, and this agony that has haunted us anymore. Lord God, we loose it in the name of Jesus. Ask, Lord, that you would uh, forgive them. We don't even want it mentioned in heaven. Lord, we ask that you would set this brother or sister free uh, from uh, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the first part, that we need to let go of the obstacles. Now let's look at some of the mountains that are in our lives. Addictive cycles, that you've come to that same battle again and again. Husbands fall into this trap where they fight the same thing again and again. Sometimes it's generational curses. Your parents uh, had these problems, you have the same problems. Maybe it's financial, a huge mountain of debt is in front of you. Now you're going to speak to that mountain today. And perhaps it's a washer or dryer or a a car or something that you need. God's a very practical God. He knows what things we have need of before we even ask. 
Maybe it's a particular sin uh, that so easily besets us. We fall into that trap over and over again. And that's going to be taken care of today as we begin to speak to these mountains. Maybe it's relationships. You and your spouse, you and your children are at odds. Maybe it's loneliness. A loved one has been taken away from you and it hurts. Or you long for a relationship. God knows the needs of your heart today. And just uh, maybe it's sickness or disease. You're in pain or hindered from doing the things that you want to do. And it's tried to bring in fear and discouragement and pain with it. This morning, I want you to be very specific. And I want you to speak to your mountain today. As we've seen in example after example, to trees, to mountains, to the sun and the moon and uh, whatever. It's important to speak the things that we want in faith, believing that we shall have those things. And as I begin to pray for you, I want you to speak out loud so that that mountain can hear the thing that you are speaking to it, that it be gone. That today will be the last day that you are plagued with these things, this mountain that has stood in your way from enjoying uh, the peace of God, the fruits of the Spirit, uh, the things that God wanted to impart unto you. Feel free to speak out. Father, I just pray for uh, the anointing of God to have faith as we begin to speak to mountains that are in our lives. Lord God, that you would uh, go before us and that you would uh, cast these mountains away from us and cast them into the sea. We would speak against sin and we'd speak against sickness and disease, the things that pervert the life that God has promised us, life, life more abundantly. Lord God, we speak to these things in the name of Jesus and command them to be gone, to be no more in front of us. Lord God, that that mountain will be dwindled down very quickly. It'll be moved out of our way so that we may move on and press on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Lord God, you know the things that we have need of. You know them before we have even in that. And you are already moving on our behalf for these things. So we speak unto the things that have uh, stood in front of us, that they be no more, that that they be cast away in the name of Jesus this very day. Lord God, that there would be a moving and an unction of God that would uh, free your people for your glory this day in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Now, let's pray. This is one of the easiest of all the three parts to pray because God wants you to pray it. He wants a closer relationship with you. He wants more intimacy. If you are content where you are, you will never go any deeper. If you are content where you are in your relationship with God, you'll never go any deeper. If you're content without revival, you'll never have revival. There has to be something inside you that desires more and a hunger. Oh, that I might know him, Paul said, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. Sometimes it goes along with that. But what I want to ask you, are you willing to pay the price? There's a cost that comes with more intimacy and a deeper walk with the Lord. Perhaps it means more time in prayer. Less time in front of the TV. More time in Bible reading. More time in the presence of God, just waiting on him. You need to ask yourself right now, do you want a deeper intimacy with God? Do you want to go deeper? God is about to take his church deeper, restore gifts to his church. There's going to be a phenomenal outpouring. You can be a part of that or be left behind. It's your choice. Do you want the intimacy with God? Let's pray together. Father, oh God, how you long for this. We're the bride of Christ, but sometimes we don't act like it. Lord God, you're drawing a church close to you, a bride that you want to empower in these last days, an anointing that God wants to place upon you. He wants us to know him like he knows us. He wants us to exchange Things and for us to be wanting and willing to spend time in his presence. But the busyness of the day pulls us, pulls us in one direction and in another direction. 
and we mean to get together with God, but the time eludes us and uh, take, is taken away from us. Lord God, that we desire and express that desire before you today. Lord God, I want a deeper relationship with you. I want more intimacy with you. I want to spend time in your presence. Lord, for there are things that you want to show us, things you want to give us. Lord, understanding, enlightenment, vision, revelation. Lord God, you want to impart something supernatural to us, deeper than we've ever gone before. And it starts with us making a commitment to be willing to go deeper with you. Father, I pray for the anointing of God to be upon your people that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. That the spirit of the living God will come upon them and touch them in a fresh new way. The moment that we take one step toward you, you'll take a hundred towards us, Lord God, and you'll meet us more than halfway if we just be willing to draw near to you. I ask that you would bless your people this day. Give them the desires of their heart as they delight themselves in you. We ask in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. 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 Would the worship team come back? And those that are prepared to serve communion, would you come as well? In the first Passover, they partook of it with their shoes on their feet, a staff in their hand, standing. They were ready to go. They were ready to work, ready to labor, ready to go into the field. You know, Jesus says he celebrates the Last Supper, that he comes and he breaks the middle matzah. There was three, three pieces of bread or matzah and the Jews have been celebrating it this way for thousands of years, and they don't know why. Well, we as Christians do. They represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that middle one was broken, and they don't know why they break it. But that's the one that Jesus broke, for this is my body that is broken for you. That Jesus reduced all the elements of the Seder feast down to two, the bread and the wine. And he is the Passover lamb. He's fulfilled all of that. And now he wants us to celebrate the Passover, in a sense, uh, when we celebrate communion with one another. Paul says, make sure you're right in the body of Christ first. Everything okay with your relationships with one another in the body of Christ? Boy, if we can't get along, you know, boy, how are we going to reach the world? They will know that we are Christians by our love for one another. We have to get along. So Paul says, examine yourself. Let the Holy Spirit examine us today, whether we're rightly fit in the body of Christ where we're supposed to be. God wants to draw us near, not only to him, but to one another. Would those that are coming, uh, please come now. You don't have to be a part of this church to celebrate, but we ask that you be a part of the family of God, that you be born again, that you're part of the family of the Lord, and uh, we invite you to join with us in communion this morning. I was a leper outside the city.
on the night that he was betrayed he took the bread gave thanks and said this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me we remember Jesus' broken body that by his stripes we are healed Father we thank you for this bread we thank you for the bread that represents you represents you and your brokenness so that we might be whole that the stripes that you received, that we might have healing. I pray for healing for the body of Christ. I pray for physical healing, emotional healing, and spiritual healing. Lord God, that you would draw near to each and every one of us today as we partake of the bread. In Jesus' name, amen. You may partake of the bread. same manner Jesus took the cup and gave thanks for it and he says this is the blood of my new new covenant we've entered into a covenant with Christ a blood covenant oh thank you Lord for the blood that has washed away our sins thank you Lord for the blood that has cleansed us and made us a part of your body we're thankful for the cleansing crimson tide from Calvary that washes us anew and again and again. For if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we ask for the cleansing power of what this cup represents to be our portion this day. I ask that you would bless it as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. You may partake of the cup. all you mothers a happy Mother's Day. Today's Israel's 75th birthday. 75 years ago, Israel became a nation, started the end time prophetic clock clicking. We're living in a day when Christ can come at any means or any time. He said that we're to partake of the communion, the bread and the wine, showing until his coming. Might not be long, very much longer. Next time, maybe in the New Jerusalem, maybe in heaven. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit and what he does in our minds and our hearts. I ask, Lord, that that which you have sown today in our lives, Lord, that you'll perform it until the day of your coming. Draw us close to one another and closer to you. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.